ATM Hotel, peace. Welcome to the Seshu Mighty Metal Nature YouTube channel. And we shortened the name to the Seshu because a lot of people were butchering that name. And, you know, I can't really blame them. And I try to correct people all the time. And uh, to no avail. <laughs> so we shortened the channel name to the Seshu. And for those of you who do not know, what that means, Seshu are scribes. And a full name, Seshu Ma'a Ni Merunetcher, are the loyal scribes of divine communication, of divine words, aspiring to be the true scribes of divine words. All right, the word Ma'a is the masculine form of the word Ma'at that everyone is already familiar with. All right, and it means that which is real. That which is true and from there you know you have people that will um take note of the expanded meanings of law harmony reciprocity balance and all of those good things anyway welcome etm hotel so this is your brother wujao reni wujao menib erimaat which says means my name is wujao menib erimaat and we are live doing another Kemet and chill open discussion q a so um if you're not familiar with our Kemet and chill series this is a series where we just pull up on you go live and allow the chat to drive the car where we sit in the passenger seat we sit in the back we sit in the trunk we sit in the hatchback we sit in a flatbed you know we uh, we you know it's um open discussion q a so if you all would like to come on the panel we put the panel link into the chat and i see that i have not done that yet so forgive me let me place the channel the um the link in the chat right now panel link and there you go there you have it pin it to the top all right so whether you're on the panel or in the chat Kim and chill is about you the viewers the listeners the participants etc so you drive the conversation and the only thing we ask obviously is that we keep up the good character good behavior that we are already um, familiar with here on this channel and that whatever topic you bring, it somehow relates to ancient Egypt. All right, because that's the scope of what we talk about. Now, we, you know, sometimes on this channel, we um, talk about things that may not seem to deal with Egypt or ancient Egypt. But if you all been around, you know, if you all, you know, familiar with me, I can tie just about anything into ancient Egypt. I don't. <laughs> because that may get on people's nerves and then you know i'll get accused oh you try to be ancient egyptian you think you're ancient egyptian and, and you know no one ever be able to uh say that i ever make those claims but still uh yeah so any topic remotely related to ancient egypt um now i do i have my own youtube channel but i don't use it and the only time i actually did use it was three years ago for like a whole year strong and that was during the um build up to the election dealing with uh reparations the conversation about reparations and all that good stuff so i you know tried to be the voice of reasoning and educate people on the um facts surrounding restorative and reparative justice aka reparations and the conversation and sift through the noise. I mean, it was a lot of bickering back and forth between organizations and Cobra. Um, the um, the faces of the ADOS movement at the time. FBA. Um, you know, you name it. It was just a bunch of noise, and and it really hurt the 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 movement towards reparation. It hurt the struggle, the fight for it. And so I did my best to explain things. So you can find that on my channel, which uh, under my name, Wujao, 
um those videos are archived there so if you're interested in that um those are things i talk about too but just not i try not to bring that uh here on this channel too much all right so with that um said shout out to everybody in chat robert ran robert ran was first up on deck he said what are we talking about tonight it's up to you robert you you um name that tune brother zane teddy what's up my ross and uh who else sister tamika is in the house and brother zane i think i already said zane yes yes so again it's up to you so now i do want to share a couple of things make some announcements real quick and so this is what i want to share with you all so and you know like like i said we here you know we like engagement we like um, participation and engagement you know we want to engage the chat we want to engage everyone we want everyone to learn we're all learning together you know um there's certain things that we may have um a more focus into may have more time spent in researching and have been dealing with things longer than than some people and so we can share we can maybe we can have uh, answer questions and things like that but we're all learning and so we can all learn from each other and so i like engagement i like for the chat to engage in the conversation like critical thinking and um and vice versa so what you see on the screen let me see if i can make this full screen because I, I just want you all to understand our format and if i can get back to it i want you all to understand our format and be very clear about our format and i guess that's yeah okay so this is our format, our, our format for our videos. And this has been the blueprint of our format, but I have been admittedly violating this almost every time I go live. So I'm publicly sharing our format so that you all can keep me in check as well. All right, because I've definitely been violating this, this format. So what, you, what you're seeing is our videos are no longer than two hours or they shouldn't have been <laughs> no longer than two hours. But like I said, we I've been violating that for the longest time. All right. So I want to be held accountable and responsible for it for it now. So, you know, when you know better, you do better. And that's what we're going to do. So this has been the outline. So two hours max for our, vi our live streams and our videos. Now, it could be shorter, but two hours is the max. Now, within that two hours, what you see is the first 10 minutes of us going live will just be pretty much intro announcements, small talk, you know, give people a chance to uh, chime in, loosen up, you know, break the ice, you know, 10 minutes of that. Any announcements, things that, you know, we got going on, things that we see or hear or whatever the case is. All right. That's the first 10 minutes. And then after that first 10 minutes. An hour is dedicated to whether it's a presentation being done, whether it's a lecture or de the demonstration of something. Since we deal with ancient Egyptian culture and primarily the language, then, you know, we do a lot of presentations on the language, aspects of the language or a lecture, whatever you want to call it. Or we demonstrate something, you know, we, we deal with that. And so we dedicate an hour to that. And during that hour, where I'm expecting people to um, do their best to pay attention, learn, take notes. Even if you disagree with something, take notes. Because after that hour portion, then we have a 45 minute segment section um, of panel. The you know if you come on the panel, or if you're in the chat, excuse me, in the chat. Um, this a 45 minute engagement. So this is an opportunity for anybody in your chat or or panelists to ask questions, to share their thoughts, ideas, commentary, what have you. OK, 45 minutes is dedicated to that. And then we have um, five minutes of closeout. 
outro sending off you know make sure everybody have their doggy bag and pack their their um doggy bag and and um for the for the food all right so this is our format and so uh and 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 this has been the format it's just that you all have have hardly witnessed us um stick to it and i'm to blame for that i'll i'll eat that but i'm sharing it so that you all hear me say it and then you know you all can hold me to it now i know some of y'all won't hold me to it because some of you all like those four five six hour um <laughs> live streams all right but um i'm gonna do my best to, to stick to this um format and also another reason why i'm giving this format um out so you all will know what to expect you know if everybody's ex expectations is in sync with what we actually do then we're all happy all right and so even if you come come to the archives we'll timestamp things and so you'll be able to say all right well I, I want to just see the engagement. I want to see what kind of questions people ask. Then you can forward it because obviously the, the engagement is going to start at an hour and 10 minutes from the time we start. So you see how it works. Um, an hour, you know, after 10 minutes, you can you can fast forward, move the playhead. An hour, we're going to get into whatever we get into. All right. So this is um, our format. All right. So we're going to stick to it. So I want you all, you know, I'm, I'm giving you all my. My. Um, contract verbal contract that i'm gonna do my best to stick to this all right now here's the thing um now this is the general this this is like the blueprint format that we're going to follow but obviously if we do a kim and a chill night where it's all open discussion then obviously the hour presentation is is swapped for for the whole you know q a uh people coming on the panel whatever the case is okay so don't so don't take this don't be too rigid with me now so but no matter what, we're only going to be two hours max. And if it needs to go over, like, for example, if we if we do a presentation that needs more than an hour to do. There's going to be a part two. Plain and simple. But we're not going to go over an hour for the presentation part. And we're not going to go over two hours for the totality of our videos. All right. We will do a part two if that's the case. Because nobody, you know, and this is strategic. This is dealing with the human human attention span, the average person's attention span and, and, and things like that. You know, we don't you know, we, that's why movies. I don't know if you all notice uh, uh, motion pictures, movies, cinema. Um, they're around two hour ish. And if it goes beyond two hours, like I remember back in the day, you all may not remember. I'd be telling my age, but the movie The Godfather. And movies like that, they had intermission. When it when it actually was out in the movie theaters, they had intermission. And, and I remember they didn't have too many movies where you actually stopped where the movie stopped and everybody went to the concession stand and did their thing, stretched their legs, went to the bathroom, everything came, sat back down, came back to order. And then they start the, the next half of the movie. Um, but the attention span of people is, is an average hour and a half, two hours to sit through something. All right. So anyway, I just want to say that now we we going, you know, let's go ahead and get into whatever you all want to get into. I see we have a guest. Let me take this off the screen. So big here. And we have son at Emmy Cat and brother Sax. All right. That's all I see as a um, screen name. So I think it's my first time engaging with you so you may want to introduce yourself and um you got the mic but 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 before you speak ladies first so uh sunday emmy cat if you want to got any words got any got any um introductions okay do a um hotep hotepu a bit e ran e emmy cat that means my name is emmy cat and um yeah not so much we'll just get into um topics All right, so brother Sex, yeah, you can. Um, Mike is yours. Passing around. All right, cool. Uh, first time here. So um, I just signed up for the intro class. Um, I'm looking forward to get started with that. That'll be cool. But my my question is, I read a couple of books recently. Um, Egyptian mythology by Robert Parisi, and then Egyptian mythology by. Um, some other author, and what I'm wondering is where did they, where do these stories come from? 
And are the translations in these books, um, are the translations in these books accurate? Okay, that's a <laughs> that's a good question, and that's kind of a mouthful of, of an answer to give for that. But uh, yeah, I'll do it. First of all, um, you say you signed up for the class. Is it the intro to um, Egyptian hieroglyphic? Yeah, that one. Yeah, I just did this. This I think like a week ago I signed up. So I guess I'm waiting on the, the book to show up, and then I can uh, read chapter one. Okay, okay. So I'm glad you you pointed that out because I'll make sure that you definitely um, get the book. I'll check on that for you, and then um, any instructions or things that you need i will definitely um give you all the information you, you need to get you started on that all right so and that, i appreciate you signing up i always look forward to people uh signing up and willing to learn and and everything like that all right um so just to just to kind of give you a quick overview of how that works um I've, I've been teaching the the a beginner's level of language for over 10 years now and i used to do it face to face in person um, then I moved to online and I had a, a huge difficult time to coordinate people's times because because online everybody lives in different time zones in different areas. I had people I had students in uh, London, England, um, on the continent of Africa, East Africa, uh, West Coast and trying to coordinate the time zones. It was very, very hard for me to do that. Um, I had to wake up in the middle of the night to give people, you know, instructions and in classes and so what I what I did, I switched it to a self-paced um, style where you follow the textbook and you go at your own pace. You can learn as fast as you want or as slow as you want. But what I do is at once a week, I'll schedule a a open Q&A for anything that, that you have a question on wherever you are in the book, you know, whatever chapter you're on, whatever things like that. So that's how and that, that's worked out a whole lot better uh, for me. So. I say that that I'll you know give you all that information where you know you can uh, begin whenever you want, and then once a week um, I go live. We have our uh, session where older students, you know, uh, current students, old students, and everybody just come on in and ask questions, and and we all just learn from each other. And I make sure that you understand everything that you go through with the book. All right, so I wanted to make sure I get that out the way. But so. Um, Amy, yes, I'm on that. Um, yeah, just real quick, I wanted to uh, first and, and foremost congratulations, um, Sax, for making that uh, move to you know learn um, the the language formally. And I just wanted to ask you, uh, what made you want to learn um, the language? Um, yeah, I've been watching a lot of the episodes on this channel for at least two, three years now, trying to follow along best I can. And um, sometimes you ask questions. Um, when you when you go through the like reading and uh, I never know the answers, so I want <laughs> I'm trying to fix that. Um, simple stuff. Right. Like which which way do you which way do you read the hieroglyphics? And sometimes I remember, sometimes I don't. And other times it's you know what is what is this triliteral or whatever? And um, yeah, I just want to know more. Okay, that's good. Okay, so all right now back to your actual question. So that was a good that's a good question. So the the mythology and myths, where do they come from? So now, in order to understand where myths where they those myths come from or myths period come from, we have to first uh have a little understanding of figurative expressions, period. Like figurative language and why human beings, why did we as human beings invent figurative expressions? And so the short and skinny of it is, one, we have to realize that writing is only roughly 5,000 years old. Okay, prior to 5,000 years ago, there was no uh, writing system, no writing. So all the storage of, of knowledge of any given population of people was done orally. So they had to transmit knowledge and store it and save it by way of orally um, giving it and passing on to the next generation, next generation, and so on. So there's no writing uh, permanency. And so what we did as human beings early in human history is that we developed a system of figurative expressions for the purpose of, of memorizing 
uh, the, the, the information for any given day and time uh, in, 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 in antiquity. And so this was a way of us using a language to talk everyday talking, you know, everyday communication for our survival, but also to store information from the past um, and the present at any given time. So it can be so it can last into the future, into the upcoming generations, because think about it. No one wants the next generation that's that's coming up to start from scratch again to figure things out that we've already figured out, you know, as adults. We don't want our children to to have to figure things out. We've already figured out. So today we don't look at it that way because we have school, we have writing, we grow up, we were born into a world of, of literacy and things like that. So we don't see the importance of it. So they invented figurative expressions. Now, a collection of figurative expressions um, put into a narrative is really what myths are. And so they're not meant to be taken literal, but there is some realities behind the symbolisms, behind the, the metaphors, behind the, the uh, tropes, all the different tropes that you find in these uh, myth, myths and, and um, different literary styles. And so behind a lot of these myths are realities, but it's because we're not part and parcel of the culture, especially ancient Egyptian culture, it's, it's now a dead culture. Um, and there's no ancient Egyptian that's alive that can, that can you know, give us the literal um, reality behind the figurative things. We have to figure this stuff out. And there's a way that we do it, and it's a, it's a, it's a tedious procedural way that we do it, um, which is, one, we have to learn the language because we have to be able to read what they left behind at step one. Then we have to accumulate cultural um, knowledge to be able to almost decipher the realities behind all these things. So where the myths come from, it comes from the need of the people to store the information for, for their day and time and to pass it on and to record it. OK, so this is why a lot of uh, cultures around the around the world, they have what's called a creation story or cosmogonical story. How does order come into existence? How do things come into existence in an orderly way? And so a lot of these quote unquote creation stories are written figuratively and we call them creation myths, you know, and things like that. Um, so they don't come from somewhere like. Uh, a specific place or a specific person or whatever it comes from the collective need to record the thoughts and 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 the uh, philosophy of, of any given period of time all right now that's separate from per, uh, intentional fictional writing you know like how we do today we write you know we write novels that are just purely fiction but even science today astrophysicists will tell you in a heartbeat that Science today is expressed figuratively uh, many times, you know, so it's, it's not something that we've uh, don't even do, you know, that we're not familiar with today. So that's that. Now, in terms of the translations of those texts that you asked about, um, there are you say, are they are they accurate? They um, the translations are very good. But, I'll, you know, obviously we don't want to take them at face value without any reservation at all because, you know, Egyptology was b born in 1832. And from then till now, that's not, that's, that's, you know, it's a long time, but then again, it's not a long time. And so as we learn more, um, the translations and the information is, is becoming more and more uh, correcting, more and more uh, accurate and things like that. So we always have to be on guard um, about the translations but for the most part they're very good the problem is is that although you can translate something it's the intended meaning behind it or the reality behind behind the figurativeness of it is what's still remains for us to dive into you know i can translate something like 100 percent accurately but what does it mean like for example i there's a word i would say um a word, a phrase, awud ib, the word, the phrase awud ib, it means to, sh to stretch the heart or it's the stretch, the stretching of the heart, the widening of the heart, 
That's its literal meaning. And that's 100% accurate. But when it's used, what, what does it mean? You know, within the context of, of where it's found in, in the text. And it's an it's a, uh, idiom or euphemism for being happy. When your heart is stretched, it means you're happy. They use it for the word joy, you know, um, in the text. Now, we would only know that by digging it more and more into the culture and, and into the context and dealing with, you know, semantics and pragmatics, um, the science of sem semantics and pragmatics in the text, you know, and things like that within the culture. So that's that's pretty much the best I can um, I can give you. You know, there are some known uh, authors and translators that that are more on point than others. You know, so you know I know you didn't mention you mentioned uh, two uh, books, but there are some you know that have a reputation of being you know um, pretty much on point, with a few things maybe questionable. But that's that's pretty much it. Got it. So. I guess I'm thinking something like um, in the book, there's stories like uh, the adventures of Sinyahe or Theo Cyrus and the sealed letter or the two brothers, these, these stories. So I'm assuming mm -hmm. they came from somebody dug up something, right? And then, and then, and then translated it. So I guess yep. I'm, I'm wondering, I know sometimes um, you'll, you'll on this channel, like find a text like that and then, and then decipher it. So right. I'm wondering if that's something that's that's ever been done on the channel. Maybe I didn't see that video or something um, for one of these like for one of these stories, because some of them are pretty interesting. Um, well, the one that you just mentioned is 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 very, very popular to us. And it was very popular back in ancient times. The tale of Senuhet or we say Senuhe. Most people say Senuhe. That's a very important and very popular um, story and tale. In that, in that story is where you find the name of the language, Rani Kemet. The name of the ancient Egyptian language is within that story. Also, you'll find uh, the name of the country, Kemet, being used. In that story, you also see where the sentiment of the people of ancient Egypt, what they identified as an ancient Egyptian, you, 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 get, you get front row seat into, into their thoughts on that because Senuhe is a person that left the country due to, you know, some certain circumstances, became successful in another country elsewhere, rose in the rank somewhere else, and then he lost his Egyptianness, you know, and, and they did not see him no longer as an ancient Egyptian. But he wanted to, in his old age, just like a lot of African communities do to this very day, Whenever you leave your home village or your home country, um, you always at least want to be buried there when you when you when it comes time for you to pass pass on and transition. You want to be buried at home. And so Sunuhe is no different. He wanted to come home and be buried in Egypt. And in order for him to do so, he had to be re Egyptianized and to become an ancient Egyptian again. And so that which means that he had to, uh, you know, uh, bind himself back to the cultural uh, items within ancient Egyptian culture and so on and so forth. Basically, he had to unlearn what he learned out there and relearned the the elements of home. And then he was granted his uh, burial in, in ancient Egypt. So that story has all those elements. I'm just, you know, just giving little highlights of the story. So that's a very popular story. And it was popular in, in ancient Egypt because it was copied. Uh, several times so in, any any story that you see several copies of and copy many times was definitely um important to the people at that time you know so but but to answer your question yes we we've we've touched on that uh we didn't we didn't go through the whole story of course but we've touched on different parts of it um different lines uh highlighted lines that we may uh go into like the ones that i that i mentioned um the tale of the shipwreck sailor is another one the tale of Senuhe that you mentioned. Uh, who else? What else? Um, hey, Osiris of course. is my favorite one, I think. Um, oh, we'll say it again. Which one? Say Osiris and the Sealed Letter. Oh, okay. Uh, the man the man who's um, arguing with his ba. We uh, deal with that one. We deal with. We definitely deal with the maxims of Patahotep uh, mm -hmm. and any of the Sabaite uh, genre. 
So, you know, you'll find those in the archives uh, of the channel. But, yeah, that's a good one. Those, those are good ones. And and those are often used for um, lessons in grammar. So when we teach a language, there's two major levels. There's a beginner's level where you learn the mechanics of the of the hieroglyphs itself, what we call session meta nature. Then there's a level where we dive into the grammar, which is morphology and syntax, and we get real heavy into it. And we use those stories, those um, texts that you mentioned, as examples, you know, to demonstrate all different types of grammar, grammatical features of the language. So Tale of Sinuhe is a popular one, Tale of Shipwreck Sailor. Those are used a lot when, when teaching the grammar. So, yeah, so we, so we use that heavily. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Yep, yep. All right, no problem, no problem. Uh, oh, I got uh, Chris. I I forgot to welcome you on the on the on the panel. See, Chris knows Chris. Uh, Chris with us. Uh, he's he's uh, one of our gram grammarians. I don't know if you hear me. Hotel. Yes, yeah, yeah, okay. You got any? You got any input on that? Um, no. I mean, I agree with everything you said. Um, yeah, I don't know what what level. Is is he part of one of your class that, that you all meet with, or is he like doing it on his own? No, yeah, you you came in um, after he introduced himself. Yeah, he he just signed signed up, and so he's gonna get started. But he was asking okay. those questions, um, and we were just you know addressing those questions. But I was saying if you had any input on on those stories, you know, and things. Or anything. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, like I said, I just co signed what you said. The story, um, sign the hat, shipwreck sailor. Um, the story of the two brothers that's kind of more of that's more late Egyptian but yeah they're all the grammars there and um, yeah I mean that's the best place to see it in application yep didn't, we are not making this stuff up <laughs> it's in there <laughs> I just wonder sometimes a lot of times I wonder if, if all the names are correct and stuff right because they always say you know Horus this Isis that so in my head I replace those with the ones I know like I said um, Haru that sort of stuff but I'm wondering if anything else is wrong in, in these in these mythology anthologies. And I would say yes. Okay. Um, but I would but I I wouldn't characterize it as being wrong though. It's it's just the um the form the form in which people became accustomed to. Like Isis is a Greek way of saying um offset. And and see, and also what we what we realized in the class, and this is something that I, I make sure everyone understands, is that our pronunciations today are in no way, sh uh, shape, or form should be taken as if these are the correct historical pronunciations. So the best we can do is have a, a good estimate of how these words sound sounded. And the reason why is because the Seshmeta Netra did not document the vowels. And so all we're looking at are consonants. And so what, what early Egyptologists did, scholars, they put a universal schwa or e, short e sound in between each consonant. That's why we say seneb, s e n e, s e n e b, seneb, um, and and you know and, and and for all of these different words, you'll sound like jed, um, per, her, jed, uh, men, all these e's. And, you know, we know that that's, that wasn't the case in ancient times, but this is just for us to pronounce these words. But when it comes to names, um, some of them are very obviously not even true to the consonants that we see. Like, for example, uh, Senuhe. That's what people pronounce Senuhe, but it's really Sahnahet when we actually look at it in the glyphs. And so little things like that, we would definitely... Um, uh, correct at least update to 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 the best quality of 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 what we what we can know and so yeah so I, but i wouldn't say it's actually wrong as long as we understand like when they say nephthys we know that her name is um nebit hut but they say nephthys and then some people say hathor but her name is really hut heru and so things like that we we understand and then osiris is really wasir oset Heru, Satuk. Um, what's another one? Jehudi uh, is another one. 
Yeah, Thoth. They say Thoth, but we know it's Jehuti. Um, right. Even the word Netter, they say Medu, uh, Metu Netter. It's Medu Necher or Medu Necher. Um, you know, so things like that we will correct. Um, what's another one? Another one, a name. Um, oh, like Ramses. We know Ramses. Uh, it's really R Ramasu. Um, uh, what's another one? Sin. I don't know from Sin Asher From Asher Quays, they always says Ramasu. Ramasu, Mary Amen, something, something like that. Yeah. Wasir Ma'ad Ra Ra. That's his, uh, that's his actual uh, name. Uh, Ramasu is his, is his family name. Yep, Ramasu, which means Ra gave birth to him. Or it is Ra who, who bore him. Um, but there's another one, um, Sin Wasaret. But it's actually Sini Wasaret, which means the man of the powerful one. And so, you know, so things like that, we, we know better, but we don't make a big, uh, too big of a fuss about it. Um, has, when the we hear say it. has the statue ever thought about um, putting together, you know, something similar, like a book of just doing what these other authors do, going through and putting a book together of these different um, stories, but just with, uh, you know, the correct translations and, uh, you know, as, as far as uh, you understand them or we understand them. I got to yes. believe all these stories are public domain by now, right? Yep. And to answer your question, yes, we have. So we that's that's one of our major drives and projects as a team. And so we kind of pause that because I want to, we want to kind of um, get uh, more people involved. So we want to bring people up who are interested in learning the, you know, the language, get get involved. We want to raise an army of scribes so that we can really do this, you know, so we can really start to refocus back on these stories and get more quality um, translations that we feel is, you know, better quality. And then from there, it's a whole nother level because now we have to figure out the realities behind these stories. You know, th when I say realities, I mean, like I said before, the figurative expre expressions are just that. But now we have to deal with the reality behind it. You know, so. You mean like um, what, what do the stories mean? Like uh, past the metaphor, what is it? Alluding to yeah. is, that, is that what you mean by that? Okay. Exactly, exactly. So, so for example, the, the one I always use an example of, uh, the popular metaphor of butterflies in the stomach. You know, so if, if I tell somebody, hey, I got butterflies in my stomach, everybody in this culture know, they know, you know, they know what I mean. Like, um, the reality behind me saying that, they know I, I don't mean literally I got butterflies in my, in my stomach, in my small intestines, and, you know, whatever the case is. But it's a metaphor for the reality of nervousness. So we know that today because we live in the culture that that has that um, that mapping of the metaphor to the reality that it, it represents. But because ancient Egypt is so far removed from us in the timeline and geography and everything um, that we don't know, uh, we're not part of of that memory. And so we have to use all of our other tools to recover those realities. So for example, I'll give you an example I, I, I use to demonstrate this. The deity Sekhmet, have you heard of Sekhmet? Yeah, yeah, I know her well. Read, read, those stories are in all these books too. Uh, Sekhmet, yeah. yeah, for sure. Yep. Okay, good. So yeah, when we read, yep, when we read stories about Sekhmet, um, we'll, we'll read the myth but then, then there's certain realities that we can, we can kind of trace out the breadcrumbs for. So Sekhmet, as a deity, female deity, she is the patroness deity over all of the medical physicians. And, and, and they're called Sunu in the, in the language. These are medical physicians, doctors. And so you have to ask yourself, why would a lion-headed, headed, lioness head female deity be over all of, you know, medical and um, doctors and things like that. Why do they, you know, have a shrine to her and dedicate things to her and what whatnot? But when you read the myths involve, involving her, you'll come to find out that the stories are speaking about, um, not only but in part about medical things or or functions of the human body. You know, the defense system of the human body called the immune system. Um, 
and so on and so forth. So those are the kind of realities that we would recover, uncover, and rediscover, or whatever the case is, that we have to get into. Not just the myth, say, okay, yeah, you know, Ra got got tired of, of humanity making noise, disturbing, disturbing his sleep, so he got his daughter, Het Heru, she changed into Sekhmet, and she went on a fiery rage and started killing people. He had to get her drunk by turning, you know, uh, wine, making it red, so she thought it was blood, so she got drunk, she calmed down. You know, that's how the myth goes, but when you actually um, dive into it with all the other tools that we have at our, at our disposal, come to find out that's a story about the human immune system reacting to ailments and diseases. Okay, that is, that is brand new information for me. I just know the surface level <laughs> story. So that's awesome. Yeah, I so, definitely want to know yeah. about that. Well, that's, um, that's, that's the level we, we are striving to, to uh, get to. So before you were talking about, um, I guess you were talking about idioms, right? How in, in Egypt they, they say things like, like uh, the butterfly example. And then yeah. there's a bunch of those in, in, in African languages. I study Swahili and um, a lot of the idioms are things like that, right? That, that um, don't make sense in English, but, um, but are common idioms in, in, in the Swahili land. So I guess I'm wondering if there's any way uh, any of those Egyptian idioms trace back to, or, or map to any like existing African language. Or, is, or um, are they all just lost? No, they're not. They're not all lost. And, and there's some work being done on that, uh, indirectly and directly, direct work being done on that. So the tool that's used to, to sift that out is historical comparative linguistics, where the relationship between um, African languages are established. Then you get into the different usage of words and phrases and idioms and things like that. And, you'll, and we'll find that that between two related languages, they have what's called a semantex, which the form will be different, but it's the same conceptualizations behind these forms that still exist. And we still have some even in English, even in English. So I'll give you an example. Um, in, in ancient Egyptian, there's a word that um, means to go down, to dig deep. And it's always used in reference to... Um, discovering something to find out something to gain knowledge in something and but it's a it's a word that literally means to go down like a spatial word means go down like walk down a hill you know and we have that same semantics today in english when we say um hey i want to get to the bottom of this and 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 notice that the that the the direction we 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 use words that are directionally down so we say, I want to get to the bottom of this, or I want to get to the heart of this, or, or that's deep. You know, I got I to gotta get deep, or, or man, you said something deep, and the word deep is to go down. And so these ideas carry on even, even to this very day. And so a lot of those have been traced out, but specifically to other African languages, those idioms and proverbs and, and sayings and things like that, um, there, there's been some work done in that area. Um, the brother Asari Motep uh, deals with that a lot. I'm sure if you've probably been on this channel, you probably heard heard of him or familiar with him. And also um, Jean Claude Mboli, whose whose 2010 work is just bust the door wide open on on the comparative linguistics for us to even be able to um, seek these things out. So so it's work being done um, on that. But we, you know, we got to take it a step at a time. No doubt. Yep. All right, I don't want to monopolize. I just thought I appreciate the answers for sure. Oh no. Okay. Well, I, I uh, um, appreciate you coming in, and, and it's good to meet you, and, and I look forward to to any other questions you may have during your journey as well. So you know, probably see, you probably hear a lot a lot from me. Definitely. You know, they call me, they call me MC Iron Lung. I, I talk a lot around here. <laughs> Fair enough. Yep. All right. Just Thank you. just on your questions alone, I can make this a whole show just about those questions you asked already. <laughs> yeah, I got I got plenty. I just don't want to uh, monopolize, but I keep I can keep going. I'm sure. All right. Well, we'll we'll, we'll circle back around. We'll we'll pass the mic and see anybody else in the chat um, as well. Yeah. 
All right. So if you all are just tuned in, um, you're listening to the brother Wujao run his mouth again. <laughs> but um, no, uh, welcome again. Appreciate anybody who's tuned in. I see the chat is uh, lit up a bit. So remember, the, the um, panel link is pinned to the top. And you're more than welcome to join the panel, participate. This is Kimmit and Chill Q&A open discussion where either you come on the panel or in the chat, you drive the conversation. But obviously, panelists take precedent over p people in the chat, you know, because if you if you if you're brave enough to click the, the panel link, then, you know, you, you get first dibs on on sharing Q&A questions, criticisms, whatever. Whatever the case is, all right? And just to reiterate real quick, just to reiterate, what you see on the screen, this is our format. So if you came late, I shared this earlier. This is our format. And I'm going to try to hold, my, not try, I'm going to hold myself to this, all right? You know, and I, I am a recovering MC Iron Lungaholic, all right? So I need you all's help. I need you all's help to keep me and keep these videos no longer than two hours. <laughs> All right, I have I have a a problem that I I've now admitted I have a problem. I'm MC Iron Lung. I'm trying to um, get rid of that title. No, but seriously, um, our videos are going to be two hours max. It could be shorter, but no longer than two hours. And as you can see, first ten minutes, you know, announcements, introductions, whatever, whatever. Um, then we get into the meat of the video, whatever that may be, presentation, lectures, demonstration, whatever. Then open up for panel chat discussion engagement, 45 minutes, and then five minutes to close everything out. That's the rough format that we're going to follow. And, and believe it or not, this has been our format. This is not new. It's just that I've been, we've been violating it, and I'll take the blame for that. I've been violating this to the to the utmost. Been having six hour shows, eight hour shows, four hour shows, and things like that. All right, so that's the format. All right, so let's check out the chat. So, Emmy Cat, uh, Chris, you seen anything? Uh, Chris, you got anything you want to share? Bring up? Um, I know it's been a lot of things going on on the YouTube streets streets uh, lately. Facebook streets, YouTube streets. Yeah, I want to have a, a discussion. I don't know if it's more appropriate to talk about it Saturday or tonight, but um, I was looking at uh, the, the Book of the Dead by, uh, for uh, Ka and, and, and Merit, and I came okay. across a section talking about the creation of how Ra created uh, Sia and, and who. Um, oh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> See? <laughs> yeah. But uh, anyway, I was going to say so. Uh, I, I want to I want to discuss that and try to discuss the um, you know what's what's going on with the symbolism behind it. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's interesting. And then also they were talking about Osiris and his hound. Oh uh, uh, yeah, Osiris and the dog. So it's a couple things I want to chop it up with you about or with the group about. Okay, yeah, we could do that Saturday. Um, only because you know that we would probably have to take. Mm -hmm. Take a, you know, take some time to go through the context context yeah. of of all that good stuff. But I, what I can say just just by you mentioning it, that though, Rahu and Sia are not shouldn't be unfamiliar to to everyone, right. because mm -hmm. um, who the one you didn't mention was Heka, um, right? But who Heka and Sia usually accompany Ra. And they and they intertwine. There's some overlap there in in the realities that that those deities represent, you know. And this is why people uh, tend to lean towards Ra being consciousness, but that's not quite. Um, it doesn't quite pan itself out. But I understand why people think that is, and it's because of who and Sia, and their involvement and in interplay with Ra on 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 stories just that, like you mentioned. You know, and things mm -hmm. like that. So, so that's an interesting thing to talk about. Yeah, but that's a that'll be a man. That'd be a whole show right there by itself. Yeah, definitely. But people gotta understand. 
Um, one thing I do know is that, and hopefully everybody listening, at least listening on this channel, should know by now that none of the deities are real, literal, sentient human beings. They're real, but not literal. And there's a difference between something being real and something being literal. And so they're not human, sentient human beings, blood, you know, flesh and blood. They didn't walk the earth. They didn't, you know, none of that was going on. So once people understand that, then it forces you to to be curious about, well, what do they represent? And then people usually say principles, but then that's kind of real vague. Oh, yeah, they're, you know, they're principles and things. But that, that, that gets vague. I, I think that's um, a lazy way out. Just to, you know, categorically say, oh, yeah, they all just represent pr principles. No, it's more than that. You know, it's multi-layered. These are multi-layered things going on. So anyway, but yeah, Ra, Hu, and Sia. So Sia is perception, for those who may not know um, what the word actually means, perception. And so think about it. Did Ra create perception? Like, you know? How can Ra create perception if, like, in order for Ra, in order for Ra to perceive perception while he was creating it, perception had to already exist in creating perception. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, um, but yeah, we definitely talk about it. So, Emmy Cat, what you got for us? Well, um, I think well, well, what I have come across, we could definitely um fit into tonight's discussion. <laughs> That's me trying to force it into tonight's discussion, by the way. <laughs> but um, there's um, you know, um, the the whole concept of what language is, the you know, the differences between translations, transliterations, and transcriptions and whatnot. Because um, through my discussions on 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 the Seshu group page, I just realized that. That, that even though people uh, put themselves in a position to study um, a language, and because when you study um, secular nature, you're actually also getting to familiarize your, your, yourself, not just with the language, but also with the writing system. So uh, in these instances, I see that um, some parts are still kind of like shaky, and, and I see this a lot, you know, just in, 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 you know, in, in this particular aspect that I, I, you know, I was involved with lately, but just also with just regular discussions when people talk that. The understanding of you know what language is, the mechanics of language, you know, basically, and just um, you know what happens, uh, you know, why are we doing what we're doing when in you know, this writing system when we transliterate and then we translate and whatnot. That I don't think most people understand, and some people just gloss over it. So I think this would be something that we can probably um, try to fit in a bit if it's possible to, uh, for tonight. All right. Well. Um well, let me let me just uh, make sure we're not missing anything in the chat, and then you can actually kick that off. Then let's just go, make sure we're not missing anybody in the chat. Um, any questions or things to be highlighted? Now I know I see uh, brother Donnie Williams. Um, he asked a question: Is there an update from the Theban mapping project? Um, no update from them. I have emailed them. Uh quite a few times over the years but recently I, I emailed them again recently about the um the images that they have mislabeled on their site and i haven't heard anything back yet uh not to my knowledge so dash for you donnie so no i haven't heard anything back uh from them but even even then, um, even if you want to use their their images, they they don't. You know, I don't know other people who've contacted them or tried to contact them to get permission to use their images, and they don't um, respond very swiftly. Very, you know, they they're not very good at that. That may have changed, but I'm not surprised. All right, so. Um, I mean, the only thing they could say is is thank you and and you're you're right, thank you, and we'll change it. That's the only thing they could say because there's nothing else that they could say. I mean, unless they want to uh, wipe the wall away in the tomb of Ramses the Third, unless they want to you know damage the wall and recreate it, they can't do anything. Can't say anything about it except thank you. Like, oh wow, we 
We overlooked that. Thank you. You know, something to that effect. Uh, let's see. Any. Oh, Ramza says, uh, Once Upon a Time in America movie was four and a half hours straight. Dope flick. Oh, Once Upon a Time in America. Okay, okay. Yeah, you're definitely telling your age on that one. Uh, anything else? Anything else? Let's see. Yeah, um, Rams, I'm not sure. Maybe you could uh, share your experiences. See, you almost got touched. Didn't know they were violent like that. Um, anything else in the in the chat? Am I missing anything? Kafri Ahmos, Ankh Wa Ankh Waja Wuja. He said Wuja Seneb. All right, that's good. You put a W on there, but he said Ankh Wuja Seneb. Unk Uja Seneb. All right, let's see. Anything else? Anything else? I'm just scrolling down, scrolling down. And then Emiket. So if you want to kick that off, be my guest. Um, Still scrolling. Yep, I'm at the bottom. Yeah, so you want to kick that off? Yeah, give me one second. Um, I was trying to see if I could share my screen real quick. Okay, so I will run my mouth until you get that together. So, let's see what has been come. What's been coming up now? You know, we've been talking about um, different topics. You know, oh, go ahead, Chris. Go. I'm, I'm sorry, to you. Go ahead and just speak on a little bit, um, real quick. I like the way you put that that wall inscription up. Showing the usage of uh, Hotep. Could you speak on that a little bit? Oh, yeah. Uh, let me see if I can find it real fast. Um, let me just see if I can find it fast. How fast I can pull this up. Um, nope, 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 nope. Right there. All right, let's see. I think I have it here. Yep. I have it right here. All right, so we're in luck. We speak on that. Speak on this real quick. Buy me catch some time. All right, so you all should be able to see my screen. So this is an example of a um, offering table or a hotep table that's um that is um that exists many of these exist okay so but what i put up what, what, what chris what you're referring to i believe is this here i posted this on facebook Do. a while but it's 2017 i think like a lot of these things see people don't people don't understand because see we're not um we're not like what we do is not popular. You know, we you know what we do is not very attractive. It's it's the nerdy, it's the nerdy stuff. Like this is this is some nerdy boring stuff that people people talk about. They're like, "Oh, that's that boring stuff." And so, a lot of stuff that we've done like years ago is is gone unnoticed because it's not popular. We don't we don't do the drama. We don't we don't get into those those you know back and forth fights and fussing and stuff like that, you know, and, and things. And the consequence of that is that, you know, we don't get a lot of exposure. And I only say that because a lot of the things that I see people talk about, we've covered. We were before our time, straight up, like from 2015 until now. We've covered almost everything that people talk about when it comes to ancient Egypt already. We, we've talked about it. We've covered it. That's why, you know, I tell people to go go in our archives. But now now what we should do, in all fairness, we should we should go back and timestamp and, and, and maybe um, write better descriptions of the video so people will know, you know, what what's covered in what video. And so that's something that's on us to do. And, you know, we got to take some time out to um, to do that. But okay, so anyway, back to what you were saying. See how see how I can I can run my mouth. 
I'm trying to give uh, Amy Cap more uh, more time, but this is what I posted up. So the um, the whole point of me posting it up, um, and I'm not sharing the Facebook post, but you know, at the time, this was like 2017, I believe, there were Hebrew Israelites that were making the claim that we made up Hotep as a greeting. Like, Hotep is never used as a greeting, you know. Why y'all say Hotep? Y'all like, made that up, you know. You just made made that up or whatever the case is. And so when I heard it, I stepped in, chimed in, and tried to educate the brother or brothers that were saying those things. And, you know, um, I did my best to educate educate uh, them. But their mind was made up at the, at the time. So I said, all right, well, listen, you, you hey, do your thing. I'm going to write a whole article on it. So I wrote a whole article on Hotep being a foul word because that's what they were claiming. They were claiming Hotep was a foul word, was a bad word. I'm like, who told you that? I'm like, man, whoever told you that, get your money back because <laughs> they definitely saw you coming. Anyway, I posted this picture sh to show examples. This is one of a few examples that I show where Hotep is being used as a greeting. So this is um, where Ramses II, who's on the right hand side, he's, he's cropped out of the picture. But Ramses II being greeted with the phrase Hotep by Meret, who is on the left, the female figure that you see um, there on the left of this picture. And you can see the phrase Iwi Em Hotep. And um, this is in front of the female uh, figure. And so let me, I know y'all can't see my cursor. Let me put my trusty arrow. And where you see the word is here. I'm going to point to it the other way. Right here. So you see E we M Hotep. All right. And so this is in the second column to the right of her body. So I said it's the first column from her body, it's the second one. So it's right here. E we M Hotep. And we see uh Meret, her name. Uh right here. And so we say E we M Hotep. And et cetera. And and it starts off by saying words spoken by. See, Jed is cracked right here. The wall is cracked, but you see Jed Medu in Meret. Iwi em hotep nefer. And then Nebtawi uh Merer or Meri Ni, etc. And it keeps going. So you all see that. So that was just an example of, of that. So and all you need is one to prove somebody wrong. And I, I met the burden of proof. And the, those folks were refuted right there on the spot. So that's that's one. Then I have another one. You see the same thing right here. You see Iwi is damaged right there in the middle. You see this right here, this, this um, damaged part going through there. But you can see. Um, the reed leaf with the legs, you can see one of the legs still, you can see the quail chick, and you see the two strokes, E, W, M, instead of the um, the half, what they call a half blunt, or half, it's the owl, and then you see the word hotep, again, E, W, M, hotep, alright, it's just that simple, Wasir Ma'at Ra Satepni Ra, you see it right here. You see his name here. Wasir Ma'at Ra Satep Satepin Ra. It's really Satep Ni Ra. Um Iwi Em Hotep. And it means come in peace. E T is is a stative. The word E is to come, is a verb to come. When we say E T, we're saying that you're in a state. Of come, which is you know we don't talk like that, but it's like a a an action was completed, and as a result of that completed action, you're in that state. And so the act was coming. Now you have come, therefore you're in a state of come. And so we we don't talk like that. We just say welcome. So we say etm hotel, etm hotel, welcome in peace. You know, welcome and peace. 
All right, so there you go. So so there you go, Chris. Um, that's what that is. So hopefully everybody everybody in chat, y'all get that? Don't listen. Don't let anybody tell you that Hotep is a made up greeting. Don't let them do that to you. The word Hotep, it literally means an offering. By extension, it means peace. And so people know the meaning of peace, but but they don't really know offering uh, as much. But it, it means offering. And back in antiquity, everyone was greeted with Hotep. We still greet each other with Hotep, even if you don't say it. And I'm going to tell you how. When you invite some people over to your house or you visit somebody's house, especially your grandparents or your or your parents um, house. You're always greeted and offered, hence offering, you're offered a drink of water, some juice, um, you know, make yourself at home, take your shoes off at the door. Make yourself at home. Would you like something to drink? Would you like some tea? Would you like some coffee? Would you like some water? Would you like some lemonade? You're given an offering. That's what Hotep is. And 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 we have not stopped doing that. And it's not just Egyptians. Everybody does it. Because in antiquity, when you go visit somebody, you had to travel long distances on foot. And if you were lucky, you had camels or horses or donkeys or whatever the case is a beast of burden as they call them and whatnot if you live near a river you can use some kind of um raft boat etc but you usually travel long distances and so by the time you reach your destination you are famished you like man I need to take take a load off. I need a, I need a break. I need some some juice, whatever. And so you would come and 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 people will welcome you with an offering. That's what it is. E T M Hotep means come or welcome with this offering. We say come in peace, but it means an offering. All right. And that's where we get the phrase peace offering. And usually people give a peace offering when there's war or fighting. And so you and so you 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 um and matter of fact, this is where Hebrews see this is see Hebrews don't don't really want to want to mess with with that. Because the thing is, is that the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And the, and the Arabic word for peace is salama or salam. They say El Salam or Assalamu Alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. And they and Hebrews, I believe they say Shalom Lek. If I'm not mistaken. Somebody uh in a Hebrew um discipline can correct me. But the Hebrew word for peace or the Semitic word for peace is salam or shalom. And such a word exists in e Egyptian. But check this out. In the Egyptian context where the word is used, shalom. It's used every time you see it. It's used when people are surrendering from getting their butt kicked at fighting or war. And so they offer Sharoma or Sharom in, in ancient Egyptian. The R and the L instead of Shalom is Sharom. And they're begging for mercy. The word in the context it's using, it means to beg for mercy. It means to give up, like throw in the white towel, wave the white flag. Like we give up. Peace, peace, peace. We give up. We give up. Be merciful. It's to pray or to beg for mercy. And so when Hebrews was trying to attack the word hotep, I was like, man, y'all, y'all, y'all better calm down from that. Because you really don't want to know what your word uh, shalom is actually means Yeru Shalom as we say Jerusalem Jeru Jerusalem it means the city it's translated as the city of peace right well obviously the city of peace there must have been war before if there's a city of peace that must mean mean where 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 a truce was made or or a treaty was was made if you're going to name a city after after um 
Peace. But anyway, all right. See, Chris, what you started? Emmy Cat, you, you ready? You got something for us? Yes, I'm ready. But before I go, uh, before I start, I just wanted to say that we, we definitely need to answer Sack's question. And um, thank you, uh, Dua Sacks, for the uh, super chat. <laughs> so. Okay, he says, um, can you show the offering picture again of the bowl or circle table and speak on that a bit? What is it used for? Okay, I will bring that back up. Anyone, anyone me, me to get away from that? All right, here, here is an offering table of um, Amen Imhat the first. That's an example of an offering table. I didn't show that before, but I'm just showing that now. All right, let me make it big so you all can see it. That's an offering table. Um, I didn't show that before, that's, but that's one. Here is a Stella of Pepe, and it's showing um, an offering given on an offering table. All right. And the very, very famous, the very, very prolific offering formula. You see Hotep Dina Soup. And it's so prolific that that was one of the first things that um, I encouraged everyone learning the language to learn by heart and memorize. And I, I remember there was a point where a lot of us had that memorized. And I believe that um, people, everybody still has it memorized. I'm sure if I start saying it, everybody could join. And if, if, if everyone was here, we could do a Hotep Dinasu, you know, and, where, and doing that. But you have a lot of offering steli. Um, but anyway, so back to the table that you wanted me to show. I'm, I'm just showing different things. Here's another um, offering. Um, but this is the one that I showed uh, before. And so what this is, is an offering um, table. And it was used to write an offering formula. And so if we were to, now this one's damaged a bit around the edges. But if we were to, if I was able to blow this up, if I had a better quality picture to blow this up, we could, um, we'd be able to read, you know, everything on it and what the offering is and usually the offering table had the offering formulas on there and then you know whoever the beneficiary of of the formula was for or made out to be and everything um it'd be a short biography or autobiography of the person um their accomplishments their ranks in society and so on and so forth and things like that along with the offering formula uh here but then function wise these um, tables, some of them were used to um, hold water and hold other items. And so sometimes you see these indentations and things um, where certain types of um, uh, fragrances, water and things like that were actually put on the on the table. All right. Without getting too far um, into it. Let me see if I can I blow this up. Yeah, we can blow it up a bit. Um, but it is blurry. You can't see, make out uh, too many of the glyphs, but you can see. Now, here's the thing. If it wasn't obvious to everyone yet, I'm going to point it out. But it should be obvious to you. This symbol in the middle is is the hieroglyph or the sesh or the, what we call the teat. And by the way, every each individual glyph is called teat. And we transliterate it as T-I-T or T. Some people spell it TJ, transliterated as TJT, teat. And it means an image, a single image. That's what the word is, teat, related to tut, tutank amen, um, in his name. But this teat here, or glyph here, is a triliteral glyph. It represents three consonants, the H, the T, and the P. And we pronounce it. Hotep with an O and an E in between the consonants, but but um, conventionally it would be Hetep, H-E-T-E-P, Hetep. So that that single glyph right there is the word Hotep. All right, and what it is, it's actually an offering mat with a loaf of bread on top, a raised loaf of bread as the offering. And the bread is tea, 
in the language, T is the word for bread. All right. Hotepu are offerings or the offering itself. Hotep is um, what is a verb or a noun to offer to to um, it can also be a word for gifts. Something of substance given. Then you have the word Jafau, which is uh, provisions like a collective. That's more of a, a inclusive word. Jafau. And sometimes in the short in the shortened form of the Hotep Dina suit formulas, the offering formulas, instead of them listing out all of the of the offerings, they'll just say Jafau. And they'll do that because they you know don't have enough space to list out, you know, T, Hinket, Ka, Aped, Seshman, Ket, and so on, all the different items individually. Alright, so it'll be uh Jafau, which means provisions. Jafau Nebu or whatever, all provisions. All right, so uh, that's, I mean, that's pretty much what I could say about this table without, you know, without I was going in on the um, the glyphs. Some some glyphs that stand out, like we could read this. So I'm going to call. See, this is how we do it over here. Now, neither Emiket nor um, Chris know what I'm about to ask them, but both of them will be able to answer this. Watch. This is how we do around here. So get my let me get my um arrow. So Chris or Emiket, I want you to tell me what is that word and what does it mean? Okay, um I definitely see uh, Sinatra. All right. What does it mean? So what? this will be incense. Yeah, where's right. your arrow? At? Yeah, where's your arrow pointing at? Right here. Oh, yeah, I can't see it. It's just a yellow line right there. Oh, okay. I mean, we can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it must be from your computer. Are you are you watching from the um? A cell phone. Oh, that's why probably. Yeah. But yeah, but I, you know, I, I was waiting for you to say it because I knew you were gonna <laughs> say it. But <laughs> no. no, but that's definitely the nature. So there is, yeah, yeah, you know. But if you're on the phone, it will be difficult. Oh, yeah, I see it now. There's the arrow. Are you still there? I don't. I don't hear anything. Oh, so, I'm up here talking out, and I, I was on mute the whole time. Sorry about that. I was saying that. Um, wow, people didn't hear me. Um, all around this offering slab table, um, the glyphs in certain places will tell you what was placed inside those holes, and so we could see um, that incense resin or whatever was placed um, either on the table or within these compartments that you see on on this particular slab certain fragrances and things were done were put on all right i'm glad you said that because somebody probably think they would put, they would put blood in there or something yeah and that that is that is what the hebrews were making the claim they said hotep is a foul word because it means sacrifice and matter of fact there's an article i did an article it's on seshmetanature.com and maybe somebody could pull that up and put the link in the, in the chat. But I did a whole article on that day because I played the video. It's a video. It's literally a video where where these guys are talking about hotel being a foul word. They say it means sacrifice and they keep it. I'm like, what? I'm like, y you don't want to really say that because one, you're wrong. And then two, 
the Bible talks about a lot of sacrifices. Like God had to come down as his own son to be sacrificed. Like, like what? If, if hotep means sacrifice and on that basis you're saying is foul, then the whole Jesus story must be foul. Because he came to be a sacrifice. And he was sacrificed, according to the story. Unlike Abraham sacrificing his son, and it was substituted with, with an animal. But he was told to kill his son. Abraham was actually told to kill his son. And at the very last minute, he, he about to stick the knife in. And then he's like, oh, psych. Sorry about that. Don't do that. Untie your son and replace him with a with a um with an animal. I forget what the animal was, but I'm sure everybody um I'm sure everybody heard that story. Abraham what was it Isaac? I think it was Isaac. His son Isaac. Wait a minute, what are his sons? You got Jacob. Hold up, you got Esau and Jacob. Are the sons of Isaac, who's the son of Abraham. Man, it's been a long time since I've dealt with the Bible, but it's something like that, y'all. You know, somebody somebody can correct me. <laughs> you know, but yeah, but it's in there. It's, it's in the Bible somewhere. It's in there. Genesis, what, 14 or 13 or 12? Somewhere around there. He about to kill his son. Can you, can you imagine being a father and and you're told to kill your son? And and you want to be devoted so much that you're about to do it, and then, and then it's a change of change of mind. Do you know how much stress? I mean, boy, Abraham probably lost all his hair on his head. He probably lost weight. He was probably like a eighty pounds wet, stressed like, oh man, I'm gonna go kill my son. Oh my goodness, but it's the Lord. It's Adonai. It's Yahuwah. Well, Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim, Adonai, El Shadi, El Shaddai, Elion, Elion, El, El Elion, El Elo, Allah. <laughs> you know, you know, Abraham is is the patriarch in the Quran too, Ibrahim, Allah, El Ahed. Anyway, all right, so. Simi K, you ready? You got you got something for us? Yo, eating up my time, but <laughs> you know we got that two hour uh, lock off time right now. But um, yeah, I think I could just um, you know I was trying to share my slide, but I can't do it, so I sent it to you. I don't know um, if you are able to share, but if you don't, if you're not able to, we can do it really quickly um, because I think this is something that everybody has had before. So you know, I could just give examples while talking. So um, I hope by now that everybody understands, um, you know, what we say, when, you know, what we mean when we say language and what language is, because we've gone over that um, a lot of times. So uh, one thing that people should know, uh, you know, at this point, just to summarize, you know, when we say language, we're talking about um, a system of signs. You've heard Mujaw say that all the time, that um, language is a system of signs. And if you've seen him explain, he will have, um, you know, those uh, three, what we call Holy Trinity. So you have, um, you know, you will have the, the, the you know, the, the form itself, um, which is usually on somewhere on your left side, if you can just imagine that. And then you have, um, you know, the concept uh, on the on the on the right. Uh, and then um, the, then between them, what ties them together, you have the link. So. So when we when we talk about language first, we know that we're talking about either written language or spoken languages. Um, but usually with such majority, we are, you know we discuss it's a writing system. So um, you know just so we understand, well we can you know uh, pull it down to just the language to the to the, the language as the writing system. So and we also understand that such majority is not. Um, such imagination is not, um, you know, uh, the the script itself is not something that um, we we are familiar with in, in the sense that it does not look like our regular alphabetic system. So when we read such such uh, you know, when you read it, uh, you read it as inscriptions. Obviously, sometimes you will read, um, you know, what people have transliterated and, and things of that nature. But the first thing is when you're looking at the glyphs uh, on the walls 
or, or, or the tombs and, and, and all of that and, you know, stuff, you're looking at um, a writing system that, um, you know, that has all this uh, repertoire of science that he uses um, to communicate, um, you know, uh, these concepts to us. So now because we do not, um, you know, we, we can't be, you know, we do not, um, we can't type such Mother Nature and we can't, um, you know, just read it directly. Not everybody can read such Mother Nature directly. So what you hear us say on this, um, you know, in, in, in when we come up and we talk about this, the text, then what you hear from us are the, what we call the translations. So um, I'm not sure, can you go to the last slide that has translations, I believe. Hmm. Okay, that doesn't show too good on your side of things. So, okay, so we'll just uh, bypass that. But this is the translation. Now, when we do, when we when we are discussing um, translations, you know that uh, we are taking what something means in in a particular language that is foreign to us, and then we are uh, we try to figure out or, or, or transfer that meaning. Uh, to a language that we are familiar with. So when you hear us say things like hotep, so, um, you know, you will see that written with what Wuja was, was showing, um, that particular glyph that looks like that. So that glyph will be for the word ho hotep. But then uh, when we translate that or when we, um, you know, transpose or, tr or move that meaning the the meaning that is um, attached or linked to that particular concept to, to that particular form that we see as that particular glyph, then we move that to 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 our language, which will be English, and that has a one to one uh, uh, relation to what we say as uh, peace, you know, rest, and things of that nature. So when we are doing that, we are translating. So we are taking one language. And then we are taking the, the meaning of that particular language and then moving it to the meaning of another language, which is, which is English. So when we talk about translation, we are, you know, we are we only we are dealing with moving a meaning to another meaning, a meaning from one language, from a target language, and then we are taking it and to meaning to uh to uh you know to a source language. Now, when we talk about um transliterations, transliterations you see as um you know, um, you know, go through different transliteration, like like I typed on the chat the word Senecha. So that will be a transliteration of the glyphs that Wujiao just um, showed prior and asked me and 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 sent Chris to 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 read. So the the Senecha that will be the transliteration. Now the reason why we um okay yeah I think you have a better screen so we can read that if you make it bigger. So. I'll just read that real quick. So transliteration is an orthographic um, endeavor. So by the conver conversion of a text from a source script to a target script. So we are taking a script from uh, from a particular um, from a particular language, and in this uh, in this instance we have Sesh Medunetra, the glyphs that you see, and then we are transferring that to um, the target script, which will be the Latin script. So when we transliterate the hieroglyphs, we are simply transferring the glyphs source over into the English Latin orthography um, script. This transfer is not a transference of phonetics. So we are not dealing with um, sounds or, or how something is pronounced. We are also definitely not dealing with semantics or what, this, what those things mean. The only thing that we are concerned with is having a one-to-one -one ratio of, of, the, of the glyphs. Uh, so, um, so this transfer is not a transference of phonetics, how something is pronounced, or semantics, what something means, but rather a convention in orthography. So thus the issues of pronunciations and meanings are not addressed in transliterations. So um, in, in the example that you see on your screen, where you have the circle with the dot, um, with the dot in the middle. So that is a glyph. And we're trying, and we are, we want to transliter transliterate that or convert that to our script so that we can write it down and, and things of that nature. So in our script, it has, um, it has a one-to-one -one, um, conversion with the word, uh, with um, the, the letters R, A, so Ra. And then uh, for the folded skins, the, those three that looks like an M, you know, that's a mess. So we transliterate that as M, S. So at this point, we're not concerned with anything um, to do with what it means, how it sounds like, and things of that nature. We just want to have, uh, you know, uh, move from that particular script to a, a script that we are familiar with. So we do that, and then we have, um, you know, we have the search, 
uh, uh, plant, and then that is for the word zoo of in, for the word zoo. So when we look, so once we have that transliteration, what we can do with that transliteration? If you've seen us go through, um, you know, if you've watched us from our Divine Words Wednesdays, where we walk through the steps of translating, and we had, um, you know, those um, four steps where you first look at the signs and you figure out what directions the signs are, and then you identify each glyph. So the identification of it, of these glyphs will be, you know, that point where you are trying to figure out what are and how they function. And then you're going to group them into words. And at this point is where, you know, you'll be trans transliterating them. And then after that, um, then you go and look into the dictionary. Uh, when you have your words, you look them in the dictionary and you come up with a sensible meaning. And that the last step, the fourth step, that's where we are now uh, applying translation. Now, the reason why I'm saying this is because, um, you know, um, you know, some people might have the idea that uh, that you can just write your own transliteration. Um, you know, you can have your own system of 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 you know I, of of writing the transliteration how you feel like. But um, obviously, this will not work, and this cannot work for for various reasons. For one, once you have come up with your own system of transliteration that only you are, are, are able uh, are using, then where are you going to look at, um, you know, to, to find the, you know, the meanings of those words? Because if you're going to the dictionaries, the dictionaries are using um, standardized systems. There are different transliteration systems that people use. You have the manual decoder and, and you have the ones with the diacritic marks and, and things of that nature. So um, in the dictionaries, whether it's electronic, whether it's, um, you know, just hard covers, um, you're going to find that the, the to look, to look up the words you're going to need, um, you know, you're going to have to learn the transliteration system. And if your transliteration is incorrect, it will be actually hard for you to come up with a sensible translation. And this is one of the things that we emphasized on, on our Divine Words Wednesdays, why we always um, walked people down through the steps of translating, um, you know, breaking it down, not just like we're doing it fast, but to show people what are those steps when you actually pull them apart and, and, and start working on them. And so if your translation is incorrect, it is impossible to come up with um, you know, a correct translation. In the event that you come up with a correct translation every time, then something else is happening. And I think, and, and I hope that this makes sense, just like a math, like if I give you a math um, problem to solve and, 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 you, and I told you to show your steps, obviously, and your steps um, are all incorrect, but then you always come up with, um, but then your uh, your your final results are correct. Obviously, then we have to figure out how you know why are the steps incorrect because the steps will lead you to to the correct translation. And this you know this is emphasized. It means they cheated. And if you've been in a you know <laughs> if you've been to uh, to one of Ujao's classes and you know how stingy he is with the certificates, uh, obviously. Uh, you know, you definitely not get anything in, in that sense, but he will have you redo it and you will have you break down the process. And, and, and this is one of the reasons why we literally did that, uh, you know, walk through those steps, you know, to show you. And obviously th at the end of it is to show you that everybody can do it because we also just came in to learn at some point. And then at some point, you know, we were, we are able to read um, to a certain degree this, um, you know, this glyphs. So once you're uh, translate. If you're using your own transliteration system, obviously it's going to be impossible to find the words in the regular dictionaries, unless you're third eyeing it, you know, using your pineal gland and, and, and things of that nature. But the 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 transliteration why I, why I wanted to emphasize this is because people I've I've had this discussion um you know in and out uh, you know between like two three years with um you know just a few uh, individuals but the problem is that people take transliterations for granted because they think that um especially for us we are very sticklers for for you know for uh tep -heseb, you know for uh you know you know the correct method because obviously we we understand that that will always if it's incorrect your method is incorrect you're most likely going to get into the co in incorrect conclusion but um transliteration's importance has to be emphasized because you, obviously you uh, the dictionaries that you require that you need as a you know as a beginner while you're learning your vocabularies and put them in your repertoire and even as as professionals obviously just like English not, we don't know all the English words everybody still relies on dictionaries but to know how to look for words in your Oxford dictionaries you also you definitely know how you need to know how to read so the transliterations come in handy in that effect and 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 in that equivalence in that 
you need the transliterations to look up the words. So this is why you can never skip the process of trans correctly transliterating things. And, and there's also, and this is because um, the dictionaries are, you know, it's not everybody really kneeling their, their own trans, you know, trans dictionaries. That's why um, we, we are kind of put in, you know, in that box of using a standard when it comes to the transliteration systems. If you're going to use Vi Vigas dictionary, obviously you're going to, um, you know, have to learn manual decodage because that will, you know, you will use that to look up the words. In fact, if you're looking up words in, in the dictionaries uh, using the Gardner code, that will slow you down for the most part. Um, sometimes you might actually miss the right words that you're looking for in, in that sense, because when it comes to such middle nature, um, the words sometimes are, you know, uh, are mixed up. So it's not like the word, uh, um, uh, let's see, I don't know, um, what's a good example? So you're not going to find the words in, 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 the, in, in all the time in the same consecutive um, arrangement. So sometimes um, a, a glyph might actually be moved to the, to the right, uh, come, you know, be, like um, quail cheek might be moved all the way to the back, even though we know, understand that um, it might be misspelled. Let's just say that it, it, the words might be misspelled. So if you're looking for a particular flow or organization of glyphs, then uh, you're going to be stuck in that sense. But if you're looking for words as they are written with transliterations, then you're always going to hit the right spot. And this is why this can, you know, you can never bypass that. You know, I just wanted to share that um, that particular one because that was um, something that I saw, and especially on our, on our Facebook group. And I know that on our Facebook group, we haven't been a lot active, but everybody knows that on our Facebook um, group, we, you know, we, we try to, to make sure that everything that is um, put there, you know, follows is correct because you know people um, rely on act, on us to actually um, you know keep keep the information to a certain standard of accuracy. So um, so when we see when something is not um, you know correct, then we will you know um, come in and figure out how to get it you know how to make sure that everything is cleared out and then so that whatever if we have on our group page, people can rely upon. So um, so. This is something that you know I you know I was um, involved with I guess lately so and I wanted to make sure that we you know we kind of get back and uh, emphasize on on the point of transliteration and we might actually do it again when I can share more. But what you see on your screen here is um, the different transliteration systems that uh, that we use. So you have the diacritic, uh, the one the diacritic, and that usually has like max. And the reason why we don't use that so much is because uh, when when we talk here is because obviously our, our keyboards, you know, you know, we don't allow us to type those and and things of that nature. So we use the one that you see on the bottom, which is manual decodage. But um, since I don't want to take too much time, uh, would you would you like to add something to this? No, no, no. That was great. That was great. Um, just keeping in the spirit of Kim and Chill and letting the the chat dictate. Uh, this this show is is um you know I wanted to check in with the chat and see if anybody had any questions, but if nobody has any questions, then yeah, you can pick back up because I just want to you know make sure that we um because we have you know for those who are hearing this uh, maybe for the first time, check the archives. We have and matter of fact, let me just show you the first. This um what I was sharing is is a presentation we've already done. And the presentation is called A Quick Lesson in Transliteration and Translation. And it's actually available on sableuniversity.com um, where, you'll, where, you'll, where you can, it's free. You can enroll, um, watch the video, and then you'll get quizzed on the information. So I, I want to interject that because this is the thing. If we spend time to go over as if we've never gone over it before, then it kind of defeats the purpose of us having an archive of us having things on Sabre University and 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 this and that so um we just got to be mindful of of that so for those who are watching and listening if you want more information on that check out the archive check out sabreuniversity.com which is this website here sabreuniversity.com you can even go to seshmedunetcher.com um and get a lot of there's a lot of resources there all right, so everything that Emiket explained is actually in this second book that you see on the screen. Second book from the left, to be specific. 
Has the Egyptian hieroglyphic writing system been deciphered? A rebuttal to Walter Williams. We go in in detail on what is transliteration, what is translation, what is transcribing or transcription. And we explain the whole decipherment process and we refute and rebuttal all of Walter Williams's claims when it came when it comes to the language. We thoroughly refute it. Put it to the rest. That's why ever since we wrote the book, you have heard nothing about it. And if you do hear something about it, these the people that you hear about are unaware of this book. So tell them about the book and get it. And then, you know, we will be happy to discuss it or anything like that. So I just want to remind everyone that these there are things we've done years ago. You know, and, and that's something that I mentioned at the beginning of our um, show is that, you know, a lot of the conversations that you hear right now um, and see online and whatnot, we've covered it already. It's just that we're not as visible as other channels, other platforms and things like that. And I and no, I understand why, you know, it just comes with the territory because we're not, um, we, you know, we don't get into the things that are attractive and, you know, kind of those, those, those entertaining type of things that, that, you know, we learn to love and like to like and everything. We're, we're the nerdy ones over here, you know, um, and stuff like that. So nobody wants to stay up late at night and be bored and, and go through different things. But yeah, so, so, um, definitely check that out. And maybe in summary, MK, if you want to go over this, this slide here and, 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 uh, just summarize uh, this and then we can check in on the chat because the whole the whole thing, you know, remember Kim and Chill, we want. I'm trying to encourage participation, you know, people. You know, we see you all in the chat, we, we're trying to we're trying to get you all to um, put your thinking caps on, think critically and, and, and you know, share some things that that you would like for us to speak on and everything. But, yeah, if you could summarize this slide right here. Okay, um, so to summarize with what I was saying, so on the top you have your um, hiero, you know, Sashmeru nature of the hieroglyphic, um, you know, um, uh, hieroglyphic, the writing system itself, and um, so that is um, that is the writing system that was used then. And then when we read it, uh, first we ha we transliterate, um, and the transliteration that you see on the, here says um, it reads you see two different types of transliterations. The top one is the diacritic, and that one you will always recognize right away because it will always have those special marks like you see on the first one where there's the S and then there's that, um, you know, uh, kind of like a, a tri tri triangular triangle on top of it. So that is the diacritic. And then the other transliteration that you see at the bottom is, um, is manual decodage. And that is the one that you will always, um, you know, see people use a lot, obviously, because like I said, this one, um, you know, um, it allow. This is something that we can use in our computer. Now, um, you notice that some of the letters on the transliteration that you see at the bottom, the manual decodage, um, some of those are uppercase, um, some of them are lowercase, and these are not just random. So these are, um, you know, the uppercase ones, um, like the S, that will be for the sound, uh, for the for the um, the consonant sh sh, and uh, if it's lowercase s, so that will be for us. Uh, uh, that consonant, and um, um, you have the the H, and that's uh, the, you have different kinds of H. So you have the uppercase and you have the lowercase. So you have to keep in mind that you will always see the uppercases and lowercases. Now they're not just there to pretty up the stuff. So this will help us understand, um, you know, when we're looking at the uh, words in the dictionary, what is it we're looking at? So we're not going to look at just um, typing um, lowercase s or lowercase m. We're going to type in uppercase s and uppercase m and lowercase m. So if you typed, um, you know, just lowercase s and m, you probably find come come up with a whole different entry than what you were probably looking for, and you might end up rendering, um, you know, the wrong transliteration, uh, the wrong translation. So I will just read the translation here, um, and uh, keep in mind that this is just, um, you know, Egyptology speak. So this is um, Shem and E, Hena F and Wahit F, and so. 
now once we we done that and we've gone into the dictionary and we've looked at um you know we've looked up the words and we come up and we've now we have to come up with a sensible translation and this is where you you apply a little bit of of grammar and obviously there's a little bit creativity um unlike um the transliteration where it's scientific two people using the same um transliteration system cannot come up with two completely different um transliteration systems something will be wrong there but when it comes to to gram to the translation there's room for a low divergent as long as the semantic value is not lost so what we have here is translated as i went with him to his tribe and that would be the translation in english Okay, excellent, excellent. So I hope everyone followed that. That was very, very straight, very, very simple. And um, so that is the gist of trans, the difference between transliterations, translation, and transcription, all right? Like I said, you can find more. I think Emmy kept put uh, the links into the chat where you can find some more information on that. So we have 10 minutes left, if I'm gonna hold, not if, but since I am definitely turning over a new leaf, and staying true to our um, f format that we've had in place that I've just violated l left and right, um, you know, as far as two hour max. So we got 10 minutes left. So come on, come all, speak now, forever hold your peace. Either you can come on the panel or I'm looking at the chat. And if you have any questions or things you share, I'm gonna scan the chat. Let me shrink this, get this back here. Okay, let's turn the chat back on. Um. Let's see. Oh, Kemetic Hebrew. Um, peace to you. Said I've had this convo, but pertaining to Hebrew, so I'm very interested. Oh, in terms of transliterations, yeah, yeah, that's the same too. Hebrew is a different script, so that has to be transliterated and then translated as well. So you know, that's you know, people and Arabic. The Arabic script is not the Latin script, so you know, we have to transliterate that. So when we say Salam. As a matter of fact, I think I had that picture on here. Um, that's an example too, but we won't go into it. But you see, this is um, a different script from Latin script, and we have to transliterate, then we can translate. Okay, so that's that. And what else do we have? Question from Sax. We have um, the Amun Ra illumination by Amun Maat Ra, the Tree of Life stuff, evidence based. Um. Yeah, I'm in I'm in my Ra. If it's the brother that I'm thinking about, I don't think there's another one that I know of, but I believe it's the same brother, of course. And yeah, he's he has good um uh investigative and methods of of um research and things like that. Um now it's been a minute since I've dealt with what he's written. So I'm not fresh um up on things, so maybe you can bring up something specific. You know, that's one thing, one thing that I, I like to do or I, I try to be mindful of not doing is I don't cata I don't do broad sweeping things, you know, judgments of, of anything. Because I've I found books, for example, I found books that are um, trash, <laughs> but but they have good nuggets in it. Like, you know, for the most part, people will be like, oh, man, that's garbage, that's trash or whatever. But it, but it has some good stuff in there and accurate stuff. And then the flip side, the vice versa, some stuff that is mostly, you know, good and brilliant. But then I was like, ah, man, but boy, that right there is is wrong. The evidence doesn't support that thing right there. So I don't I just try to my best to stay away from just categorizing and sweeping. Um, but what I can say about I'm in my Ra from what I remember about um the brother's work is that he's he's um diligent in in his um studies and everything like that and he has a um what do you call it very good intent intention he's not like trying to sell some stuff that he made up and everything like that no definitely i will second that that um uh i'm in uh, uh i'm in Ra. Uh, I mean, my art, my, the he's um, he, you know, obviously, first and foremost, um, when we're discussing, you know, what is evidence based, then you'll probably be uh, with particular information in the book, so it won't be just generalizing. So you'll be, you know, we have to go through what particular uh, piece of information is in question. But I would say this that he's very diligent, and then, uh, and obviously, he's also a very good character person who, if anything was, um, you know, 
incorrect he would be you know and it was brought up to him he would definitely you know be more than happy to look at it and 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 you know appropriately um you know make changes and things of that nature so that's one of the benefits of having people like that yep and i definitely second and third that brother is humble he comes with questions he, he even you know comes and inbox me uh, from time to time asks me um different things and stuff like that so definitely Yep. And that's what that's what it takes, because we all we all, you know, can can um do whatever. It, it takes that very good character to be to um have tenure in doing this kind of work. So I will definitely vouch for the brother. But, but OK, so Sax, you're specifically asking about the tree of life um, mentioned anywhere in the text that I'm uh, aware of. So here's the thing about the tree of life. Um, the tree of life is made famous by the Kabbalah and most people hear about the a tree of life by way of the Kabbalah or the Osar Set Society um, who's under the leadership of um, Raul Nefer Amin and so if anybody's familiar with either the Kabbalah or the um, books that are authored by Raul Nefer Amin you have definitely heard of the tree of life and though the concept of the tree of life is not a literal um, explicit concept that you're going to find in Egyptian texts, even the diagram of the tree of life that that you may see where you have the circles and then and then lines are drawn from one circle uh, to the other, et cetera, et cetera. You will not find that image anywhere in ancient Egypt. Uh, not to say that we have to either, but you won't find that. Um, but what you will find is that there are group, groups of gods that are grouped together for certain reasons. Um, one in particular you call, we refer to as the Pasejet, which is a group of nine. And that word Pasejet means nine. If you count your numbers from one through ten, you'll see Paseju is the number nine. And so the number nine is significant in the ancient Egyptian culture because it represents the plural of plurals. So it's three by three. So it takes three to represent plural and then to pluralize the plural, you multiply it by three. And so we come up with the number nine. And so the word Pesejet or Pesejet Necheru, which is the company of the gods or the company of the divine or divinities. And so these, these different groupings will have certain functions that you can relate and you see the interrelationship between those functionalities and things and what they overlap and, and um, interact with. And so the, the Venn diagrams that you see, they're called Venn diagrams, showing the relationships between the functions of these various different deities. And so that's what you see in what, you, what is being called the tree of life by particular people. But that's not literally or explicitly found in text that way. But it's, some, it's, it's certain things that you can deduce from reading the text and, 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 and develop from reading the text, but they're not in the text them, in and of themselves. So I hope that kind of um, answers that question a bit, you know. Um, okay, so hopefully that, that will uh, answer that question. Let me see. Do I have anything else? Um, I see Ramza says, uh, it's one thing not knowing, but rejection of truth is, is there any, is there only, oh, only for unforgivable sin, but that's the main thing they practice, blasphemy. All right, let's keep going. Um, all right, Sax, following up. The book mentions the Netur Seker governs the third sphere of the tree of life. That's what I'm asking. Is that evidence based? I'm aware of Ron the Fair Men's works. Yeah. So is it evidence based? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, the 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 what I mentioned earlier still applies. So you can you can you can deduce many things from text, but it like I said, it's not explicitly there. So for example, when you have the um, group of group of deities, you have Atum, Shu, Tefnut. So Atum is self created, right? He is um, Keper Jesef, as he describes himself. He is self-manifested or manifested himself. 
Then he, he sneezes tefnut and coughs shu. So tefnut comes from the word tef, which means to spit. And shu is, is dry blast of air. It means to, it's literally the word dry, dryness, shu. And so shu and tefnut comes forth from atum. And that's moisture and dryness. And those are human reactions to, to some reaction to something where you sneeze and cough. And then from Shu and Tefnut, you have Geb and Nut. And from Geb and Nut, you have Usir, Satuk, Oset, Nebet, Hut. And then so on and so forth. These deities represent a grouping, a family grouping. And so they're described in a familial, using familial language of brother, sister, wife, husband, twins, Oset and Nebet, Hut are twins. But at the same time, sisters of Satuk and Osir, then they then Oset marries her own brother and stuff. So we think incest is going on and all this other kind of things. But these are ways to explain the relationships of these various different deities. And so you can take the various different stories or different texts, depending on which one you're look, you're dealing with, and you can extract these relationships. And so these relationships, when put out vis visually, you can create these Venn diagrams that you see like Raul Nafir does. Or other people do and things like that so when you ask are they evidence-based um, um, not explicit but you can do some deducing and and you know follow some logic and you know so that but that's but that take a that takes a lot of um, unpacking you have to unpack all that stuff to find out what is um, true what is more accurate and what is just completely wrong and made up, you know, so you got to you got to be careful with that. So because you brought up Ron Nefer's work, so let me give you a, a for instance. Um, in his work, he refers to a canine bus by Sebek. And Sebek. Is can only be talking about a crocodile deity, which people tr tr um, spell out Sobek. They pronounce it Sobek. The only other alternative that that could possibly be. So if it's if it's Sobek, then that's wrong. It's a crocodile deity. Sobek. Not a, a, a dog, not a wolf or a dog. Um, now, the only thing close to that that would make sense is the word Sab. But it's not Sebek, it's Sab. Spelled a certain way, transliterated a certain way, Saab. And the word Saab means canine. It's a word for canine. It's also a word to judge. Okay, there's a word Saab means to judge or to discern. And then there's a word Saab, which means uh, deals with canine. And so all the canine deities are parts of judgments. So we have Enpu, Wapwawet. Well, Bawet, the messenger, or whatever the case is, Enpu, the one who is involved in the judging, embalming, judging, and so on and so forth. So those things need to be unpacked and explained, but in, in certain people's works, uh, they don't explain it like that. So this is why I say, and we, we, we're at the two-hour two mark, so I'm definitely going to wind this down. This is why I say for every group, Every author, every group, especially a group, now maybe not all authors, because I don't expect everybody to get a bachelor's degree, master's degree, PhD, or become an Egyptologist and things like that. But anybody that's going to talk about um, the ancient Egyptian culture and, and whatnot, you have to go through the language. If you don't go through the language, you are handicapped. And if you're handicapped, then you're in no position to stand before people and and try to, you know, march people forward if you yourself are handicapped. You got to get yourself together first and then you can help out other people. And so the only way to approach ancient Egyptian culture is by way of its language. Language is the DNA of culture. OK, so the only way we have access to ancient Egyptian culture is through its language. And so I fault certain people in groups who don't have that as a focus first because it opens them up, makes them vulnerable 
to mistakes or misinterpretations and miss, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll miss the mark. Okay. And so I find that when I read certain, certain uh, people's materials. So the Assault Set Society as a group, man, Round the Fear, Around the Fear of Men has done some brilliant work um, and created a very good organization. The Assault Set Society has been around since, what, I think 1970? 72 or 1970 and um and so you know there's some ver there's some a lot of good work um there in that organization but then there are things that are not that needs to be you know adjusted updated corrected or whatever the case is and whether they do it or not or stuff like that you know that's that's beyond me i'm not i'm not i don't know enough um or close enough in the or to the organization to even know any of that but what was 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 revealed publicly, you know, we can we can critique and and update, correct and stuff like that. So. But the only way we can is if we take it upon ourselves to do things correctly by by way of the language. All right. So having said all that, you know, like I said, we're going to do a hard stop. Um, It's been two hours. I'm not even going to look at the chat anymore. That's why I turned it off. <laughs> so, Amy, can you got anything? Any last words? Um, yeah, if you had a question that wasn't addressed, I've definitely copy, copied and pasted um, that for next time. So the first 10 minutes when we go live next time, then we'll, pro we'll probably start with those questions. So we'll just be there on time. <laughs> but other than that, I think this is good and I don't want to take too much time so that we get off on, out of track. So I will just say dua for those who are watching and make sure that you check the archives. We have some short lessons, short videos that you can digest. Um, check the playlist when you go to our archives. So, you know, those are, you know, um, you know, we've, um, you know, um, ha we have a directory where we kept everything according to topics. So you can definitely look for what you're searching for, if it's cosmology, if it's language in particular, if it's the uh, Divine Words Wednesdays or the freestyles and, and things of that nature. So check the playlist. And then if you haven't joined our group page, Definitely do because it's about to get lit in there. This, um, you know, we enter in the second quarter tomorrow of 2022, and we are going to be active and shaking things up. So join our Facebook group. Um, the link is actually on the video that you're watching right now, or below the video, the you know the 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 uh, details page. Uh, look look that up, and then um, you know join our group page and have we're going to have um, good discussions there as well that we can do. Uh, we don't have time to do on, uh, you know, uh, live. So definitely join the group page and dua and uh, get an affair if it's good, if it's nighttime and uh, back an affair is, if it's morning time. All right. Well, MK, you said it all. So I'm going to say I appreciate everybody tuned in and make sure you subscribe, like the videos. I think that affects the algorithms and we get more exposure and all of that good stuff. And I will see you all next time. But be prepared. We, we'll just pull up on you out the clear blue sky or the clear night sky, clear starry sky, whether it's raining, snowing, sleeting, tornadoes, hurricanes, we'll pull up on you in a minute and bang on your door and be like, read. <laughs> anyway, but I appreciate everybody tuned in. And we're going to get some, into some more topics, some more presentations uh, and whatnot. All right. So Shimon Hotep. You said that when you go to chemistry school, you became more alert. You, you made a wake up, your spirit wake up, and you became a more human being. That's your character is built in a school. studies uh, you may we must know me do nature you see maybe in the future we need to know some meritic too we need to know me do nature
most achievement in Kemet for me is education. The way they think, they build, and they practice their education is very unique in history. Without education, I believe there will be no Kemet.